What's up, NHL fans? Happy Tuesday. The vibes are high this morning with Colby and I. This is Morning Cup of Hockey presented by Betway. If you're going to place a bet, bet on Betway. Please play responsibly. And remember, you must be 19 years of age or older. We're going to have Frank Sarabelli joining the show anytime soon here. We'll talk about Philadelphia last night and that crazy game with them against the Islanders. We'll talk about how the Eastern Conference playoff picture is shaping up with those Three or four teams now. We'll talk about the St. Louis Blues and Los Angeles Kings. That gap is now shortening as the Blues are only three points back of L.A. And a lot to get into today just as far as everything goes in the NHL. But, Colby, what's going on? I look like I'm boring you already. You don't – what the fuck? <laughs> He's you lounging? Are boring. You He's are lounging? boring me. You are boring me already. Welcome to – I'm fired uh, up, man. I'm, I feel really good today. I don't know why. Why? I just said I don't know why. I just like him. Yeah, a good why reason. though? You have to have a reason. I don't know. I think shit's just like going well. Yesterday was fun. Um, Are you excited that the Rangers lost? I feel like you get excited when the Rangers lose. Why would I get excited when the Rangers lose? No, I, I uh, honestly, I had a really good um, like one-on-one -on -one chat with Crosby yesterday that is going up on DailyFaceOff.com today, and um, you know, it was cool. I got to talk to him after the game when he tied Gretzky's record, and you know, those are like you know me. I'm I'm a uh, you know, I'm I'm a giddy guy, I guess, when it comes to that stuff. And, uh, you know, talking to Cindy Crosby twice in one day, like in a one on one setting is kind of like a really cool thing and something that uh, I had to take a step back and understand. You know, two years ago, I was working a nine to five corporate job. And yesterday I was at MSG talking to Sid one on one in the locker room. It's just like, you know, kind of take a step back and, and uh, appreciate that stuff, you know. Did you glaze him up a little or what? <laughs> uh, no, I did not glaze him up. I, and even though you had that in your vocab, uh, proud of you for that one. Um, that's my. Uh, that's, that's a new my, one for you. That's my attempt to sound cool, like you know, the like the young, <laughs> like the young kids. Yeah. Did you glaze him up? Um, no, nah, but he actually is like he's so nice, man. Like it's it's crazy <laughs> how. Uh, what am I getting? Am I getting chirped in the chat already? Recon gamer said uh, you were splurging over. Oh, uh, Recon Gamer was in my fucking Twitter mentions all night throughout that game. <laughs> all all night throughout the game. He was Is Recon that. Gamer a Rangers fan? Yeah, he is. Um okay. and he hates me more than anyone. So Well, look, let me just say <laughs> this before we before we start really kind of diving into the show a little. You sent me the audio from your interaction with Sidney Crosby. Yeah. <laughs> and look, <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. I'm laughing. Um, nobody gives you more shit in this world than me, right? Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah. That was yeah. Re that was really good. Like what you, you did with Crosby was really good. Uh, are we do, are we just you're saving it for your article? Yeah, yeah. That article's gonna get posted this afternoon. Um, plus, right, it's like so it's a long, it's a long audio. I don't want to play it on the show. It's. You know, are you putting it on your? Will you put your put that on your Twitter? Yeah, yeah, DFO okay. will so, tweet it. I'll tweet it. So, so Johnny did have a a really great three question interview, like in a scrum. Oh, you're talking I about guess. the post game. I'm just talking about whatever you texted me last night. Oh, that was yeah, the post game, game scrum. Oh, oh that yeah. wasn't even what I did for the article. Okay. So yeah. the post game scrum that you did with Sid was, was it was really good. Like I, I I'll give you credit there. I mean that was um oh I said really good and a thumb popped up. Uh, that was really really well done. You got Crosby to laugh like three different times. You know, he's usually a pretty serious guy. You got him to joke about his old confrontations with Henrik Lundqvist. Um, you know, I think you actually caught him off guard with your first questions. Yeah, but I definitely did. In, in a good way. Yeah, like, that was the plan. You're such a, you're such a little, like, dummy, like, <laughs> you, like, that you think of these questions that are just like, ridiculous that nobody would think of to ask him so um i will say good job on that i will Thank give you. you props um i won't tell people how you responded to me giving you props no in, i'll say it in the I'll group chat it. we'll just keep that confidential um okay. <laughs> but good job seriously that was well done i i i really thought 
That was well done. It wouldn't work with every player, but him, who's Mr. Serious and, and you know, he's up, very uptight. Um, it was cool to see you pull some personality out of him, which doesn't happen all that often. So obviously helps that they won. They haven't done a lot of that this year, mm -hmm. but um, you were at that game. I mean, while we wait for Frank, like I, the NHL was kind of backwards last night. You know, there was some April Fool's Day. There was, was some Day in the NHL. There were some results that um, <laughs> good job fraternizing with the enemy. You can't win. Rangers that, fans actually. Gamer again? Ra no, that was um, New York Marine. I'll tell you what. Rangers fans hate you, which is kind of funny. It is kind of funny how much Rangers fans kind of hate you and hate on you. Well, it's because I, I'm i not like a – like I, I have to cover yes, other you are. teams. I have to cover other teams. I'm not just going to shit on every other team and like only be a Ranger fan. I love hockey. Like I love – It know, is like, true. I think I've learned this more this year doing this show that f fan bases are all a little sensitive about their team. And yeah. like you could say nine good things about a team and then one thing that you didn't like and all they remember is the one that you didn't like. They completely ignore the nine things that you said that were great. Um, no, but that... I'm talking about my own team here. Like, like with the Rangers. So last night, because, because I talked to Crosby and talked to the other team and compliment the other team, as opposed to just shitting on Jacob Truba and Keandre Miller, like every other Ranger fan was, I'm the bad guy. Instead of just complimenting the other team. Well, I, I, I it was, it was a job well done. Nonetheless, um, All the right. Rangers definitely played an April fool's game along with a couple of other teams in the NHL. Um, and I, I I hope you post that post game scrum somewhere for people to see because that was that was well done. What you what you got out of Sid last night was uh was a job well done. I think even Frank would be proud of you uh, for for getting that out of him. He definitely wouldn't have have, have asked those questions, <laughs> but he would be he would be proud of you for getting a little personality out of him. So let's bring Frank into the show. Um, you know we've got Frank Frank Tuesdays. We haven't ever really come up with a better name than that, but uh, God, what's, that's what's you guys really put a lot of work into that. <laughs> I mean, I I have a name for it, but I'm not allowed to say it. So. I won't. I won't <laughs> allow him to use the name that he wants to use for your appearance on Tuesdays. Does it? Does it involve somehow Daddy Daily Faceoff? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> what is wrong with this guy? Exactly. That's why I won't let him do it, Frank. Did you? Did you hear? So Johnny, I can't keep a straight face. While he's like geeking out over there, Frank, <laughs> as somebody who has been in a million media scrums oh. in their life, um, mm -hmm. his first question to Sidney Crosby last night, I thought was really clever. And I didn't it hear made, it. I'm going to, I'm going to tell it to you, but it, he, made, why don't you get convict? Does Vic have a teed up? Can we play it? I don't know I don't, if we have, I don't think if, he does. Cause we, yeah. we, it's, it's a long video, but I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll surmise for you. He basically said to him, well, I can, I can get it to Vic in a second here. He said, now that you've reached or you you've broken um, Gretzky's record, whose text are you going to reply to first Gretzky's text or your mom's text? And he like really thought about it. It caught him off guard and then he laughed and then he gave him a really like back and forth, like unsure answer, but it got him very loosened up for the rest of the questions that he asked. And like, I, I, I really did as somebody who shits on Johnny constantly, <laughs> I thought it was really a job well done. So wait, today's April 2nd, the April fool's jokes are over. You I know can't this be is giving him this flowers. Is, this is, uh, what are you doing? This is new territory for me. Even yesterday I had, I had like pizza sports guy in our chat agreeing with me that things are going too well for me right now. I, I had I'm like, like I, yeah, I just, what, what is today? Opposite day. Tuesday? Like what you, you oh. guys can't, you can't get along. I know it's you don't uh, worry. Say nice things about each other. We have 50 minutes left, Frank. We're going to we cancel have... the show. Stop. 50, it's not, it's 50 minutes left. Well, uh, let's, let's get into some serious stuff though. I want to ask you, cause we actually, this is something we debated yesterday. Um, just about the heart trophy and what the meaning behind it is. You know, I, I think it should be taken into account how good a team is like, you know, I, it's hard to argue against McKinnon, Kucherov and McDavid right now. But I think the Panarin and Pasternak deserve a little bit more love because, you know, they're like 35 plus points ahead of the next guy on their team. And they've gotten their teams 
ahead in the standings of the other three. Like the Rangers right now are in the lead for the President's Trophy. A lot of that has to do with Panarin. Boston, you know, as of the last time I looked at the standings, which was like last night, I think they were fourth in the NHL overall. And Pasta's got 102 points. Marshawn has 63. Like, I think that should be a little bit something when you're talking about the Hart Trophy, no? Yeah, I mean, guess what separates the Rangers in first all the way to the Oilers in ninth? Was nine, it five, five nine point, points? Nine points. Nine points. Uh, they're four points up on the Avs. So, look, uh, there's also a games played disparity in there. The Oilers still have nine games left. Mm -hmm. The Rangers only have seven. Um, I, I think when it's all said and done, the team argument is going to be relatively moot because they're all going to be within a handful of points of each other. And traditionally, that hasn't really impacted the voting of the award. Um, I think Panarin has a great case. I think this has been far and away his best career season. Mm -hmm. I think he's carried this Ranger team for a long time. And that said, he just, he doesn't have, while his, his numbers are impressive and this is a career season for goals, he doesn't have the same numbers that the rest of the guys do. And that's a huge differentiator i mean we're talking about at the end of the day when the season's over and the final numbers are counted like panarin's gonna be 20 points back that's too large for a lot of guys that's a quarter of a season yeah even if the goals are there though like it might not be as many assists but he's gonna have as many goals as you know the guy in front of him he's got 40 well, i'm glad, you're, I'm you're glad you brought an up argument the, well you're no i'm, I'm glad you brought up the goals are because that's actually gonna really hurt mcdavid yeah. To me, uh, the assists are fantastic, but he's he could finish 18 to 20 goals behind McKinnon and and Kucherov. And I just I'd have a hard time, even though he might win the scoring race, I'd have a hard time going down that path as the number one vote on my ballot, even though he's I think the best player in the world, because again, his totals are just the, the total is there, but the goals aren't. And that's a pretty big difference. He's 18 back of McKinnon and 13 back of Kucherov. And he's 15 back of Panarin. I mean, that's a huge difference. Well, let me ask you this too, Frank. And I don't, you and, know, I don't and know. By the how, way, for a guy that scored 64 last year, somewhat quietly. Yeah. I don't know how well versed you are in basketball. And I don't want to like make this about LeBron James, but every year, in the NBA, when you talk about the MVP, it's it's a no-brainer to ask who the best player in the NBA is, and someone says LeBron James. Just like in the NHL, who's the best player? It's Connor McDavid. I, I mm -hmm. think that's an automatic answer every time. But when it comes to the MVP voting, it's always it's different, right? Because you can easily give it to McDavid every year, right? Just like you do for LeBron in the NBA. But LeBron's only won like four MVPs in his career. So for this trophy specifically, why are there so many if and buts and all these things that go into it when really it could just be handed out to the same guy every year or is it just because we want to spice it up and no, whatnot? I, I don't think it's wanting to spice it up. I don't think it's about any sort of, you know, narrative heading into this year that, oh, this is McKinnon's year. He just deserves it because he hasn't mm -hmm. won one yet. I, I did hear some people in some circles of social media voice that kind of back in September, October. But you can't look at his play this year and tell me that he's not deserving of being in that conversation for being one of the one or two best players in the league so far this year. I think he's two in general after McDavid. Uh, yeah, and I would agree with that as mm -hmm. well. So, you know, me personally, I, I don't think there's any ifs and buts attached to the conversation. I think it, it's really based on best season and and i think really what it comes down to is are you a literal voter or not mm -hmm. and by literal i mean do you stick only to the definition of the award which is most valuable to his team it's not most valuable to the league it's most valuable to his team and if that's the case then you're probably leaning towards kucherov yeah because he's head and shoulders above everyone else on the lightning and, and then even some, Panarin. 
with some really good players and Panarin would be in that conversation and you'd probably be parking a little bit further down your ballot. McDavid with dry having another hundred point season and McKinnon with Rantanen having another hundred point season. Well, not even Rantanen and Kobe. Sorry that I keep jumping in here, but okay. who would you say? And I, and I think me and Kobe might be thinking on the same page here, but after McDavid and McKinnon, who do you think the next best player or most, uh, I guess ask him who's going to be number three on his ballot. I mean, they, no, 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 it's but no, no, it's it's not it's not that it's who's if you're building a team after McDavid and McKinnon. Well, that's a totally different. No, no, but, yeah. but who? But who's the next guy? Who's the next guy you want? Probably Kale McCarr. That's what I was going to say. And does that not hurt McKinnon either? Having the two, of, you know, ranting in with a hundred points no. and McCarr, who's probably the third best player in the NHL on your team too. No. That doesn't hurt. It doesn't have anything to do with. My yeah, we're problem. going. We're talking defensemen now, and you're 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 kind of. But it goes them. into the overall, you know, so MVP. Frank, give us give us this idea for for our listeners. So you're obviously a voting member. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I think one thing, if I'm not mistaken, you you publish transparency on these votes, correct? Yeah, everyone can see everyone's ballot. Okay. Um, which I think is really cool. So make sure you keep an eye for that. When when exactly will you vote and when does all that um, come out with the transparency. You so don't have to give we'll us get, an exact day, but ballpark. Yeah, we'll get our ballots in the last week of the regular season, and they're due back usually the night of puck drop of the playoffs. So, like, actually, if the playoffs start at 7 p.m., they're due back at 7 p.m., and then they go – They they we don't get sent the ballots. They get sent to an accounting firm, and they go through and count them up. And then the awards are handed out in June. It'll be like June 24th this year. And the next day after that, we publish all of our ballots. My favorite and so once that, that is, happens, like I help determine the voting list of who votes, but then I don't know anything until after the votes are counted up and after the awards are handed out. Well, my favorite thing is always reading that the people who didn't give you the ballots back, it's like... <laughs> they get to well, feel some the people shame. have different you'd be shocked at what pops up hey you know my dad died this week i didn't get my ballot in like pretty fair reason to not vote like there's there's always some serious stuff that pops up and then there's always a couple people that are just a little bit careless that don't they didn't get it in and they don't vote again we take your vote away yeah well that was more of what i was referring to not the but not there's the always vote. some like crazy serious story too um how do you, how do you how, balance? I, I want to ask you guys this because I've, I'm struggling with this myself when it comes to my ballot. How do you factor in Connor Hellebuck? Do you factor in a goalie? For MVP? Yep. I, I don't. Yeah, typically. I don't either. Yeah, Unfair, I don't. Probably unfairly. Yeah. Um, but, but again, if you're talking most valuable to his team, you'd have a pretty think, hard time arguing that Hellebuck is not the Jets MVP. Thousand percent thousand percent and just, he's his numbers transcend pretty much every other goalie yeah like and where would the most, Jets be without him i yeah. mean they're they're it's the most critical position on the ice and so some people could make the argument well if you really are serious about having the mvp talk with goalies then your ballot should be five goalies every year and i'm like no no they have their own award they're off to the side yeah no but I, well, I, I, I think, think hellebuck actually has a really strong case this year to be somewhere in my top five that I send in. Okay. I so think, that, that was my next question for you just technically. So you put five names on your ballot and then is it a point system? Like if you yep. get a one, you get five points. If you're a two, you yep. get four points and so on and so forth. Yep. Okay. And how many people vote Frank? Uh, about 175. Wow. Okay. Wow. So it's a big group yeah, a of people. Yeah. Yep. And, just back and, to that point. Oh, yeah, and yeah, is yeah. it a, is it a pretty diverse group? Meaning writers, GMs, coaches. No GMs. Or... It's just media. Uh, for at least for our award. So it's we do the Hart, Norris, Calder, Selkie, Bing, the end of season All Star teams, the all rookie teams, and then in the playoffs we do the Conn Smythe. Got it. So there's a combination of national media, local media, regional media. And then we media. also invite in some broadcasters, like 20 to 25 broadcasters that do games nationally around the league that also chip in and vote. Gotcha. No podcast hosts? No, no, Johnny. You're not getting a vote. <laughs> You'd have um, to take off your Rangers jersey first. 
<laughs> I want to go back to the, well, speaking of that, I kind of want to go back to the point you just made though with Hellebuck. Two years ago, wasn't there like a real consideration for Matthews versus Shesterkin for MVP? Like I remember Shesterkin getting a lot of MVP talks in his 21 22 year. I, I personally don't remember that. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, are you talking about the year that, that Matthews hit 60? Yeah, and Shesterkin won the Vesna, but they were both like pretty much from what I remember. I mean, listen, at the time I wasn't in the media, so I don't know how serious it was. It was probably just amongst Ranger fans, but I remember the conversation being Chesterkin has a legit he, case. He finished third in hard voting that year. Oh, wow. He was a full thousand points almost back of Austin Matthews. Yeah. Who was second? Connor McDavid. Obviously. So, Frank, we got a good question in the chat that I want to ask you, staying on this goalie conversation. Chris asks, do you think it hurts a goalie's case that they don't play a quarter of the games in a season? Now, Hellebuck, probably, Hellebuck probably plays more games than most, um, but for most goalies, it's probably even less than – it's probably more than 25. It's probably more like 35% now, maybe even closer to – 40% in a lot of cases like you know so I think that's probably a pretty reasonable thought and question how do you Frank as a voter um, how do you take that into account with when you're talking about a guy like Hellebuck so Hellebuck has started 55 of 75 games that's 73 percent so you're right just about 27 percent he's on the bench and he does play a lot, but not as much as Georgiev, who's he was in the 60s already a couple weeks ago. He's probably going to finish around, I think, 66 ish. Um, it's a fair question to ask, but my retort to that would be and this is just like conceptual and philosophical. Okay, but the games that he does play, he's on the ice for 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we While just had that. On the bench. We just had someone say that in the chat. New York Marine just said that. And then someone out, someone clap back at me when I said that last time, and they said, "But yeah, the play is only in his end. How many minutes a night, and how well, how engaged does he have to be?" And I'm like, "No, no, this that's is not insane. how it works for goalies. Yeah, this is goalies insane. are engaged the whole play, all 60 minutes plus." Right. Mm -hmm. That's an insane rebuttal. I think to to dig that deep into. How many times do their knees bend in a game? You know when they're in their well, stance. Or, you know, how much time? Sorry, how much zone, is at, How much uh, zone time is is is? I mean, I don't think I. I know you're starting to split hairs there, but I don't think yeah. that that's insane to say. I mean, come on. I don't, no, I don't think that that's a crazy thought. You know, teams only spend what 14 minutes, 15 minutes in the offensive zone in a game. Yep. I mean, I don't think it's crazy. I'm not saying it should be weighted. In an yeah. all star MVP vote, you of all MVP people, vote. Mr. I hate the advanced stats and analytics. You want to get into that's that? not advanced stats, no, zone that's, time just a, that's a counting stat. Zone time has been something that's been counted for years and years and years before mm -hmm. the analytics crowd came out of the woodwork. So let, let's let's call a spade a spade here. Fair enough, fair enough. So, but where do you come out on it? Would you like what would it take? Like, how special would a goalie need to be? So, Shesterkin, he's the last guy that was a Hart Trophy finalist. I mean, he had like a he had like a 0.96 save percentage, right? Like, it was something crazy, something like that. No, it definitely wasn't nine six. Well, not not I don't think the way he finished it, but um, that I think year he, he was nine thirty five. Yeah, nine thirty five. I mean, still, Hellebuck is at nine nineteen this year. He was at nine twenty five for the bulk of this year. His, the Jets have given up a bit of late, and by the way, have continued their slide. Yeah. Um, Seven in a row now. I, I personally, I ha I think he belongs somewhere on the ballot, but that's I'm not saying in top three spot, but he yeah. will be part of my top five. And they they did beat the Kings last night. What about? What were, Dem what were Demko's numbers? I know he's hurt. Yeah, he missed a chunk of time. Game. That doesn't help his case. But Frank, I always hear you make the argument about guys who are injured. Um, were they that much percent better than everybody else? Like, I remember we were talking about the Connor uh, Bedard versus Faber argument earlier mm -hmm. this year. And, and I've heard you do this year after year. So this isn't like a new thing. You've always been... Um, 
consistent with this argument for a guy who misses a chunk of time. Mm -hmm. Let's say they miss 20% of the time. Are they 20% better than everyone else? Right. I've heard yep. you. Do you apply that logic to a goaltender who um, only plays 70% of the games or is that not logic, not get put into that because let's just say other factors. It's just a different position. It doesn't get put into that for me. So Bedard has played 60 out of 74 games, which is 81%. So you're right. Basically 20%. Was was he, in the games that he played, was he 20% better than Brock Faber? It's a really difficult equation because they don't yeah. play the same position. Obviously, Faber's minutes are way different. His point production has been excellent. Mm -hmm. I'm really going to be wrestling with that Calder vote yeah. because... I think to me, there's not really any question of who the best rookie is. And I, with all due respect to favor, I still think that's Bedard. Yep. But that's not what the question is. The question is who had the best rookie season. And there's a real strong argument to make that that is favor. Yeah. And I I'm with you on that. Like, you know, I, I think that that, I think Bedard will win the award. Um, but I, I think that it's, I actually be... don't. I think the current is going really? the other way. And I think really? a lot of people are leaning towards favor, but I, uh, that's just from like, you know, chatter that I've heard amongst friends. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I would support, if I was a voting member, that's probably would be one, two. And that's probably how it would go for me. Favor um, one. Favor. Bedard yeah. Two. Yeah. And, and with the same rationale that you have is that, do I think Bedard's the best rookie? Yeah, I don't think it's even close. Do I think Bedard will have the best career? Yeah. But when you look at the body of works this year and you look at how much, you know, better um, or or look at the situation with Faber and the minutes he's played and the types of minutes, and yeah, Bedard missed 20% of the games. And I, don't, I think if they both played the same amount of games, I, I think it's probably not the conversation. Um, but you know, again, I, I, I do, I did see some other players on social media talking about Faber thinking like he probably should be above or, or right there with the merge, right. The last time I said that, I, I mean, the Blackhawks fans came for me with an absolute pitchfork, not the first time, by the way, um, having worked there for a couple of years, but <laughs> I don't disagree with you on that, Frank. I, I think that's a real serious possibility. I think it's so, crazy. Well, Faber's leading their team in ice time. He gets north of 25 minutes a night as a rookie defenseman. And he's got 40 points, 41 points. It's crazy. Yeah, no, and I don't want to knock him at all, but I think that's more of an indictment of the rest of their team. But still, like having 40 plus points as a rookie defenseman, I mean, some defensemen don't get to 40 points in their career. It's an incredible season. Like, I'm not taking anything away from it. I like I said, I think it's the best rookie season, which is what the at least right now. That's what the award should be. Mm -hmm. I want to throw one name at you for Calder that is not getting talked about and won't win. Mostly because most people don't realize that he's still a rookie. And that's Pyotr Kochetkov. Mm -hmm. If you look at his numbers, someone asked me yesterday, how do you feel about Carolina's goaltending heading into the playoffs? And I'm like, have you watched Kochetkov since January 1st? 921 save percentage, 11, 6, and 1. I mean, he's been as good as anyone in the league over the last few months. And people forget that he's a rookie because he played 24 games last year and he, he played, played the playoffs three. two years ago. Yeah, exactly. So people are like, rookie? What do you mean rookie? But he actually still qualifies based on the definition of the rookie limits. And so therefore he counts. Like you have to consider him. But so, I still think I still think in that argument though, like Faber came in and just I know we got a couple. Games I said he's not. It's yeah. not impacting the top two, but I, people are going to need names to fill out the rest of their ballots. And Kochetkov, by the way, unreal nickname. They call him Cooch. Uh, he's uh, <laughs> he, he 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 counts. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. I, I think that. Well, I think. Yeah. Let's, I want. Let's I want to bring something up quick, if if possible. Speaking of like rookies and whatnot. Let, let's let's try to wrap the 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 awards talk because there are other things I want to talk to Frank about. So go ahead, finish, Shawnee, and then I want to move into a couple of other topics. Well, this them. isn't about the awards. I was going to transition into. Okay, go ahead. Is that is that allowed, Johnny? Stop asking. Go. <laughs> I well, I hate when you give me that voice. It's fucking annoying. Um, 
But I wanted to ask you, and Colby actually sent this tweet into our chat last night about the college free agents that are signing now. Vic, if you can pull up the tweet from World Hockey Report, yearly reminder that the undrafted NCAA prospect your team signs is going to be an average AHL player for three years. Do you see a lot of truth in that comment? Because, you know, Colby and I pretty much agree with that. And, you know, I know Quillen signed with Toronto yesterday. Um, you see Graf's name being thrown around a lot to Quinnipiac guys, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more. And I know I'm leaving a lot more names, you know, off the, t- off the tip of my tongue right now. But um, what are your thoughts on these college free agents that a lot of fan bases get so excited about that don't really have a big impact on their teams? Yeah, the hype train gets rolling, and part of it is a media thing because they hear the name a lot. They see the scouting trips that are being made to see these players. And part of it is there's not really much else to talk about from a player transaction standpoint. Once you get past the deadline, there's not really that much interesting in terms of what's the next big thing to happen really until you get to the off season. So that's part of it. Um, I will say there's obviously some exceptions to the rule. You see one on a nightly basis in Jimmy VC, who, by the way, He deserves a lot of credit for finding his game again. Back to being a double-digit goal scorer in the league, seems to have found a a home for himself after a pretty big dip in his career that I think I probably wasn't alone in thinking his NHL career was on the ropes uh, around that time he ended up in Van. Uh, That said, I think, look... um, Tori Krug's another one. I mean, Yeah, the batting average is like... uh, It's like 10%. Like... (laughs) one out of every 10 guys ends up being a, an impactful special NHL player. Like that you can, it's you know, VC, Matt Reed, Tory, like go, go through. And yeah. there's always a few guys that stand out that end up making impacts. And by the way, I would, if I were to place a bet on this year's crop for me, it would be Quillen. Yeah. And he, he goes to Toronto, Nova Scotia kid, uh, I was told yesterday that it was down to the Leafs and Bruins. Mm-hmm. You know, Canadian goes back to Canada. And I, I'm not saying he's going to be an impactful NHL player, but I think that's a decent enough bet Yeah. if you are Quillen saying, hey, look, as as good as the Leafs are up top, their bottom six needs a lot of help. And well, it needs a lot. It needs help, Frank, and you need players that are making those rookie deals 100%. when your team is so top heavy. And I think people always wonder, like, why would a guy like that go to a good team when he probably could have gone to San Jose? He probably could have gone to Arizona and had more opportunity. Well, you know, not always because those teams are loaded with prospects. Because yeah, the prospects. First round pick after first round pick. Like, I know, like the Chicago Blackhawks this year, they were not interested in any of the free agent names, graph. I Quillen. talked to a number of GMs yesterday that said, I'm not, not only am I not a believer in these players, but I don't really have room with the entry level contracts I have to be signing players. I really need to be careful in how I'm handing out contracts because I don't want anyone getting in the way of our really good prospects. Yeah. So that well, was and- another consideration too. And when you think about Quillen and Graf, I think people need to keep this in mind, okay? And I'm with Frank, and Frank and I have talked about this a, a number of times over a couple of weeks now because I, I saw a lot of Quillen and a lot of Graf. I did a mm-hmm. lot of their games the last couple of years. And, you know, you look at these guys and how they play. And, like, with Colin Graf, right, top top line player at Quinnipiac in, in the ECAC, which is, you know, not the hardest conference in, in college hockey, He's got to be a top six player for you. Where in the NHL is he going to be a top six player? And like, what is Colin Graf's B game? Because you're not going to have your A game every night. And that's where I think these kids flame out a little bit because their B games are not good enough to be top six players in the NHL. And some of them can't play bottom six roles. Jacob Quillen, to me, is a guy with a B game, okay? He's a guy who can, on his off night, so okay. okay, yeah. So explain that for me. What is a B game? Because I've never heard the term. Okay, so your A game, you're scoring goals, you're making plays, everything's going good, your legs feel good. Okay. The difference between a guy who sticks in the NHL and has a long career and an American League player who's a good player in the American League is the fluctuation 
okay, of their off nights. You have to learn as a pro how to manage your off night. You can't be an A and then the next night a D, okay? You've got to learn how to have a B game to stick and play in the NHL. Now, there's the freaks. There's the elites. Those guys are different. But everybody else, Jimmy V. Oh, is that something people actually talk about? Like, if you're... Like co a coach will will say like, hey, look, I know you can't be going every single night. Absolutely. What is your net? What's your? I, I had that conversation when I got to pro hockey. It was one of the first conversations my coach in the American League had with me, and he said, Colby, you've got to learn to have a B game. He's like, we're playing eighty games. It's not going to be perfect every night, but the nights it's not good and your legs feel heavy, you have to not have the drop off to a C or a D if you want to play in the NHL. OK, and you watch the consistency of these guys who are NHL players night in and night out. They know how to have a B game if they don't feel good. How can I contribute if I'm not making big plays? OK, how do I learn how to contribute? And Jacob Quillen, to me, is a guy who when I watch him go from night to night at the NCAA, the night he's not scoring, he's still finishing hits. He's blocking some shots. He's making plays defensively. He's got big back checks. He's got awareness. So to me, he's managing his B game and, and that style of play. Coaches 100% talk about this. The GMs will talk about it with you as a player, as a prospect. And I think when you look at these guys who don't work out, big problem they all have is they, they're missing a B game and they don't learn how to develop a B game. And Jimmy VC, who you brought up, is a perfect example of that. What happened to Jimmy when he stopped being a top-line player, top-six player? He really floundered for a while. He didn't know how to have that B game. He resurrected his career because he learned how to, be, how to, how to manage those nights and how to play in the bottom six and still contribute as a hockey player. So what happened to you? You only had an A game and a D game? I had like a B minus and an F game. I think that was okay. probably the big problem for me. So, but, but, mm. but uh, it, early on, <laughs> you see young, young players struggle with this. They struggle yeah. with consistency. You can I look had an at a game and I had a healthy scratch game. <laughs> right. You can see it with any of these top prize prospects. Like Patro is a good example this year in Boston, right? When he started to fade, what was his B game? How did he get to his B game? So, um, I think a lot of that goes into these things, Frank, and and I think it's something that doesn't get talked about externally, but I know it's talked about internally with people. Another uh, college free agent I got to give some love to, friend of the show, Frank Vetrano, undrafted player out of UMass, signed to Boston, played in the AHL, called up, and is only friend of half the show. That's true. Well, no, they they, uh, they became boys. They're boys now. I'd say Colby and Frankie, but. Uh, yeah, he got called up and never really looked back in his NHL career. So there, there's probably more examples than people think. Like to me, yeah. it's probably a case of it's like everyone, if everyone piles on and makes fun of the president's trophy, then all of a sudden it becomes, oh my God, you don't want to win the president's trophy. It's a curse. And it's like, no, actually, if you look it up, 25% of president's trophy winners win the cup. And it's like, if there's one omen you could get that gives you a 25% shot to win the cup, like to me, I'm like, okay, sign me up. I'll take 25% chance to win the cup entering the playoffs. Why do Often. people shit on it year in and year out? Oh, it, look at the last team to win the, the president's trophy and win the Stanley cup the same year. It's like, okay, make fun of it. If you want, mm -hmm. Frank, I got one more topic I want to dip into with you before we let you go. Um, and it's this whole Philly goaltending situation with these two Russian goaltenders. And um, I, I'm just curious, like, how the hell did all this go down? Like one second, this guy is shipped to Siberia to do his army, you know, because he he faked his army service. And then all of a sudden, Sergei get, Fedorov gets fired. And two days later, this guy pops up in, in the city of Philadelphia and, and nobody knew about it yet again. Maybe you had some inkling. I don't know. But nope. like what the hell has happened in Philadelphia where they go from losing Carter Hart to bringing in Megatron and Megatron light. If you see the size of these two guys and, 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 and Fedotov looked really good last night. I mean, I watched him for two periods when he came in last night, he looked real like the real deal, but how did all this stuff materialize? And then one other question to just tack onto it is 
How can they play if they make the playoffs? Can you explain that reserve list process to people just so they can wrap their head around why a college free agent can't play in the playoffs, but a drafted player or protected list player can? Yeah, so when you draft a player, they get added to your reserve list. You can have 90 players on your reserve list, and they are your team's property. So the whole time that, and I guess we're calling him Fedotov now because I was, well, yeah. that's what they were calling, I was calling him on the broadcast. I know, but I was calling him Fedotov forever. So now Me I call him that better. better. Too. We like <laughs> Fedotov better, but they were calling yeah. him on the broadcast Fedotov last night. Kind of sure. a buzzkill. Fine. Yeah. Fedotov just sounds hilarious coming out of Kobe's mouth. Yeah. It sounds like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Fedotov, uh, he had an okay year this year. I think they, there's a lot of frustration there, I think, between probably player and team, uh, not the Flyers. But when you go sign an NHL contract and you go to leave the country and on your way out or to the airport, they grab you and put you in you know, mandatory service for a year. That's like that comes right from the hockey team. The hockey team was was angry, CSKA, that he was leaving. And so no one's really willing to say that part out loud, but because of the connections there between CSKA and the highest reaches of government in Russia, they were like, oh no, we're not letting this guy leave. And so they picked him up and then threw him in service for a year. And then, oh, by the way, you're coming back, even though you've signed an NHL contract, we don't care what the double IHF says about a transfer and agreement. they're useless. The IIHF is a useless body. They're, they're a joke. It, well, they're supposed to be regulating things like that. If you have a binding contract in one league, you're not allowed to play in another. So he plays after a year away, comes back and plays and he's just okay. And they have an okay year for them. Their standards are crazy high. You mentioned Fedorov getting fired. And then they're like, okay, we don't need this guy anymore. We're terminating the contract. And the whole time the Flyers are like, oh my God, can we get our hands on this guy possibly? How could we bring him over? And the reason why it didn't leak or come out is because the Flyers were not willing to say one word until they actually saw him on U.S. soil and someone picked him up at the airport and they believed yeah. that he actually made it all the way here. And then they could sort of collectively breathe a sigh of relief and say, yeah, this is where we can start. And it also happens to come at the exact perfect time for this team, not only in the playoff chase, but everyone knows what happened this year with Carter Hart. They basically threw uh, Sam Erson uh, right into the mix that, uh, he's asked to be doing a lot more than he probably should. Um, everyone has been, their goaltending situation has been taxed. And now all of a sudden it starts to look a little bit different. They get Fedotov in the mix. They can start now working on the next contract because he's actually technically an unrestricted free agent when this deal expires, because he is 27 already. And they also got Alexei Kolosov in town as well, a Belarusian who played in Russia, who now is heading to the Lehigh Valley Phantoms to close out the year. So their goaltending situation in a three-week period of time, kind of for the foreseeable future, has changed pretty dramatically. Yeah, and I think it's so ironic that Sergei Fedorov was the coach. We all know the story. You know, Sergei Fedorov takes a penalty, heads off to the penalty box, and then he pops up in, in the United States a week later to, to defect from the old USSR to come over and play here. So I think it's ironic. I did hear. And why and ironic? I mean, it's well, it's, it's just, just ironic life there. I'm saying it's ironic that he was the head coach blocking this player from leaving Russia. I don't I think it was him. I think he he gets it. Well, he but also... can I just tell you something? I, I'm going to tell you from the highest source in the Philadelphia, you know, front office. He told me straight up, Fedorov worked greatly against the Philadelphia Flyers in this situation. Oh, he was a I'm sure major that's the roadblock. Case it, he's he's protecting his own team, and that's that's part of what I was saying. That that team specifically has always worked hand in hand with government 
right. um, that they're, they're closely tied. So um, not a shock. He, he's like, I don't want to lose my goalie, but he ended up losing him for a year, punished him, then bought brought him back. And basically it was basically two years of conscript conscripted service because this past year also playing again for CSKA, like that's, that's a lot to ask. Yeah. Will this have any effect on Mitchkov in the future at all? Or is that a separate? Totally situation? separate thing. I think so. Reminder on, on Mitchkov situation. Yeah. He he's playing for SKA St. Petersburg mm -hmm. and he's actually well, no, on he's loan. Under con he yeah. He's okay. under contract with SKA, but he's on loan to Sochi. And so his contract with, SKA runs through the 2025 26 season. So that's the earliest technically right now that the flyers could get their hands on him. Mm -hmm. Is there a period of time at some point where that contract either gets terminated or SKA? There's a million things that could happen. They yeah. could run into financial trouble if possible. And they come to the flyers and say, let's work on some kind of agreement to negotiate a buyout of this deal what will it take to make that happen? Ideally, the Flyers would would like to get their hands on him as soon as possible, but that also seems like a long ways off. Forgive me for not like knowing. I'm actually just genuinely curious about this. If you know the difference, but so wh why can't that player Mitchkov like break his contract in Russia, but a guy like Kovalchuk can sign a 10 year deal in the NHL and then dip and head back to Russia? Well, he, he could, but the same thing would be in play that the NHL just tried to work around with Fedotov, which is uh -huh. if you have a contract with one team, you are yeah. bound to that team. So if if Mitchkov were to just somehow get on a plane and end up in Philly, uh -huh. he's still technically under contract, and the NHL, according to their agreement with the IIHF, can't actually register a contract with him in the NHL for him to start playing because he's still legally bound to someone else. Yeah, Was it Johnny, not there's, the a, there's a central registry in the NHL. And then that uh -huh. filters through the double IHF. And like Frank said, they're supposed to regulate it. Yeah. You know, they're, they're a pretty iffy body though. I mean, they're not, they don't really have their shit together. I mean, you see a lot of issues. If you follow international the hockey, the Kovalchuk contract was terminated. That's why it he was. Go. Okay. Yeah. He it got, was he got a full yeah. termination on that. Yeah. Okay. I thought he was still getting paid for a year nope. when he, I just, yeah, I don't know much about the, you know, I mean, that was also 14 years ago. If it, you were or, busy fanboying then I was in, I was in high school. <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, Frank, yeah, we don't want to, yeah, yeah. we don't want to take any more of your time. You gave us 45 minutes. We always appreciate our, our Tuesdays spent with you. Um, I want to take more of your time, Frank. But I'm conscripted into morning cup of hockey. Sir. <laughs> we, 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 exactly. One day a week. We tell you it's going to be 20 minutes. We usually keep you for 50. Um, we appreciate it. I know your show. You've got a, a show today at 12 o'clock on the DFO YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe to everything we have going on here at the DFO. There's so much content, um, whether it's DFO, Leafs Nation. I mean, there's just such a big family of things we have going on here. And this is our, uh, our fearless leader. Mm -hmm. always stepping hey. up showing us his fearlessness and 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 having our backs and that's I'm, why we're cooking up him. some we're starting to cook up some stuff for next year so stay tuned all right good good all right frank have a good day and i'm thanks, sure frank. we'll talk a hundred times today but we'll see you later see you guys thanks frank um before Hold on, we i just want to i just want to yeah. finish with with the flyers fedotov conversation um uh -huh. the flyers looked horrible last night i mean yeah I've never felt worse about them making the playoffs. Like to me, the flyers look like the team. Um, tell Colby, Joe Rogan said hockey is for weenies. Um, that Did came really from how we feeling. I mean, I listen to Joe Rogan, not every episode, but mm -hmm. um, I've also heard him talk about the NFL like that. He He's not a sports guy. He admits that he really is a fighting guy and he's mm -hmm. not like a team sports guy. So I've never listened to a Joe Rogan episode before. He's he's there's no better podcast show host out there than him. There's a reason it's the number one show. But anyways, I don't want to go too crazy off topic. Um, 
What I was going to say is, is that the Flyers look like the team that everybody thought they were to start the season right now. You see Torts quote, if you don't have enough balls to play in these games, rest doesn't do you any good. Torts was on one last night in his post-game presser. Um, my question would be, why the hell didn't he start Fedotov? I'm not calling him Fedotov. On this show, he's going to be known as Fedotov. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Colby, tell us some Molly Bloom poker stories. I don't think uh, this is the forum for the Molly Bloom stories. Maybe we'll get Molly to come on the show at some point. Cool. Molly, is my, Molly is my first cousin. No, she's not a hockey fan, but she has gone and spoke to like four or five teams in the NHL. Like the Toronto Maple Leafs brought her in to, to speak to their group. Like a bunch of NHL teams bring her in to speak to their teams. But here, here's where I was going with this Flyers thing. Mm -hmm. Big problem that I have is... If you don't make the playoffs now, to me this year um, be, is a huge problem because you didn't tank, which I know people hate. You're not yeah. get you're you're not getting a top draft pick in the first ten picks. Okay, if you miss the playoffs, I, I have a big issue with the way this year went for the Philadelphia Flyers. I really do because to me it seems like yeah they put their culture in and Torts had a bunch of moments and. Yeah, you got the best out of Owen Tippett and Morgan Frost and probably a couple of other guys, but I, I just would say that they need to find a way to make the playoffs or this year feels like a massive, massive miss to the fans of Philadelphia. I mean, they also have to trade away their top prospects because uh, he didn't want to go. Like, that's a, that's a huge part of it, right? I, I mean, know. like, I know it's, it's out of their control at that point, kind of, right? But, um, you know, if you don't make the playoffs, you lose your number one prospect that you had coming up. Um, that's tough. But also, I think, you know, what Torts was saying yesterday, too, in that press conference, I watched the whole thing. I, I've started to watch a ton of Torts' post-game press conferences. I think they're just amazing entertainment. But he was basically saying, like, we have guys who can't play. Like, we need to figure out the future of where this organization's headed because if I'm going to coach a certain style, I need guys that can play a certain way. And, right. you know, the Flyers, obviously, this summer are going to have a lot of turnaround. I think, you know, on their roster and whatever they're going to do going forward, whether they make the playoffs or don't, it seems like Torch doesn't really have the guys he wants. And obviously it's easier said than done. To go I don't agree with that. Guys. Well, I, I completely Did you disagree. listen to that press conference last night. Listen, he's angry right now, but like, yeah, let's go. You go through their lineup a little bit. He's found out a lot about the players that he has and he likes. OK, tip it. Frost. He therapy. said a lot of guys in our team can't play. He flat uh, listen, out said that. They, they, they're in a bit of a rough stretch right now, but I yeah. mean, that's a very different rhetoric than he's been spitting all year. So I, I'm yeah, just but these saying, are when the games matter though. I don't think that you're going to see a massive turnover on their roster. I, I totally, I'm look not at the saying contracts. 10 guys, but like, look at the contracts. There, there will not be, there, there will not be massive turnover on that roster. There just won't be. All right. Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, I kind of want to play the Paul Maurice clip too, just while we're on the topic of coaches. Um, well, I don't get know into anyone... the get into the Parasso playoff preview first. All right. Okay. All right. Let's go into our Parasso playoff preview presented by Parasso, the most complete choice for shaving and beard care made in Italy since 1948. Parasso has been a staple of Italian culture and barbershops globally for four generations. So get 15% off at Parasso-USA.com with promo code Hockey15 in all caps. Hockey 15, that's 15% 15 off at parasto-usa.com with our code Hockey 15. But Paul Maurice and John Tortorella, two of the coaches in the NHL that just give you soundbite after soundbite. And Paul Maurice yesterday was talking about defending Austin Matthews, and me and Colby got a kick out of this one. So, Vic, let's tee oh, that man, clip up with Paul Maurice. Well, he's got 60 of them, so nobody's figured that out. I'm not the smartest guy in the league. I'm just going to put a bunch of guys out and hope they defend the hell out of it if we can. I mean, you're, you're not stopping them. Just hope he scores the next night, not the night that you're there in town. So, yeah, I mean, a brilliant, brilliant player. And, uh, you know, in that elite category of players around the league that you you don't stop. You, you He's going to get his. You hope your goal has so when looking at the playoff picture in general, Florida, as of late, they're three, six and one in their last 10. I was actually uh, texting Kobe Armstrong about that game last night because he was on the call. He said Florida looks slow. They look tired. Um, you know, maybe 
They peak too so, early. Yeah, maybe the way they play has just caught up to them a little bit. I mean, they play that playoff style every night in the regular season. And, you know, I didn't get to see any of that game. I don't know if you caught it, but what a crazy game that was. I think Toronto had a 5-1 lead. The final score ended up, what, being 6-4 at the final? They, there was a little push at the end, but they yeah. certainly, um, they're certainly looking like they maybe peaked too early. So the question is going to be, are they going to be able to kind of regroup and play a couple of good games? You don't want to go into the playoffs feeling, you know, shitty about the way that your team is playing. Um, you know, that's not really, uh, a good recipe for success. Mm -hmm. So I, I do worry that, that they, they peak too early Florida. I really do. Um, I don't think it's as clear as it was a month ago where everyone was like, Florida is the best team in the NHL. I unanimous, unanimous. Number one, right. I certainly do not see that as the case right now. Um, so I, you know, we're going to continue to monitor that as, as we get down the stretch here. I mean, some teams are down to, like seven or eight games, um, mm -hmm. you know, like you basically can count periods at this point it, it left in a lot of team seasons. So, you know, what they do over the next couple of weeks is, is incredibly important. You know, again, Florida needs to play three or four good games before they go into the playoffs. Like, yeah, I'm not saying you panic. I'm just saying you, you want to have that good feeling in your locker room of confidence. Um, and confidence is really earned, not given. And, and, like you could have had a great first half of the season and a terrible finish. And like the confidence might not be there. It, it might not um, be there. So I think playoffs this year are pretty, pretty wide open. Um, I really do. And, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of how this uh, finishes out. Um, so, you know, make sure you take advantage of, of this deal we have with pro Rasso, especially you, Jeremiah. Um, I, I, uh, I think you were the inspiration behind this, uh, behind this sponsorship that we got. Um, and the other thing I want to comment on, Jeremiah, I see your thing in the chat that you said, I always forget your cousin is the inspiration from the movie Molly's Game. Yeah, I mean, the movie Molly's Game is based off of a book um, called Molly's Game that my cousin, my first cousin Molly wrote based on her experiences. I did get to spend a lot of time around those poker games. I saw a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I even when they did the movie, I, I got an opportunity to sit down with Aaron Sorkin, who who wrote and and produced the movie, um, because he wanted to hear my uh, account of things. Um, so it, it cool. was a pretty it was a pretty cool experience. That you know, we're at the end of the show here that we won't get too much into, but yes. Um, and, and I saw someone else say Philadelphia Eagles legend, Jeremy Bloom. Uh, it's pretty too. cool because Jeremy, my first cousin who lives in Colorado, grew up in Colorado. Um, he gets drafted by the Eagles in 2006. And then in 2007, I get drafted by the avalanche. So we just kind of switch places there briefly um, with, with our homes and our, you know, uh, and, and where we got drafted. So let's, let's, uh, let's pivot and let's, let's get into the games tonight. We still got to get to our Betway bet of the day. Um, maybe we just start with our, uh, with our Betway bet of the day. Um, uh, obviously we always do that when we get into our, our preview. Um, and we're going to have Vic come on and, and take another run at our Betway bet of the day. Uh, we're still running this great promotion from Betway. You get a free bet of up to $200 if your bet loses. Um, you can get this by scanning the QR code right on your screen. You create a new account. The bonus will automatically load up into your account. Take your bet. If you lose, no matter how much you bet, it could be $200, $700, $1,000, $1, whatever it may be, you will get that $200 right back into your account right away you'll take that 200 and then you'll go ahead and you'll try to make your money back so you've got all this opportunity it's a great uh bonus welcome bonus i guess you would call it from betway uh the offer is only available outside of ontario so to any of our listeners who like to get up early with us uh in canada especially um jump on this use it we want to keep betway a part of our show we want to keep the offers coming we want to keep opportunities coming to you um so what do we have for our betway bet of the day today vic we're going to give you another opportunity to come in uh you've got your leafs nation hoodie on naturally 
Um, so we got to sure. give you an opportunity to redeem yourself. Yeah, He's been afraid I, to show his face around here. <laughs> yeah, I got the hat on. Uh, the head's not shaved, so I'm waiting for my Parasso blades as well. So uh, let's get on here. And our bet of the day is going to be Washington Moneyline. Um, they've lost two in a row, Washington has. And they're the underdog here against the Buffalo Sabres team. But Washington's been playing well. Juicy. Yeah, it's juice. It's uh, nice and juicy. And Washington needs a, uh, a win here bad in a big way. They're fighting for that playoff spot. The Flyers passed them, but uh, the Capitals do have a few games in hand. So we're going to take the Capitals straight up money line at plus money. I can't believe we're getting to that plus money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to say, I think Washington is in store for a win after losing to the Flyers are one point ahead with a couple of, you know, the Washington has three games in hand. Like, Washington is looking at this as an opportunity the next two or three games to put a little separation and a little bit of safety into that final playoff spot um, or not final playoff spot into that final divisional spot uh, in the Metro. So plus money in Buffalo against yeah, you can't the trust Buffalo. Buffalo. Yeah. I mean, you can never trust the Buffalo Sabres. No one's so even I- going to those games anymore. I, I yeah, like no that. Doubt. I do like that. Um, I think that's pretty good to get plus money on something like that. So uh, eight games total tonight, Johnny. What games would you say stick out to you the most? I'm sure you're going to say Pitt, New Jersey. There's there's implications there, but what are you thinking? No, I was actually thinking, and it's probably not the best matchup, but the Islanders in Chicago. I mean, the Islanders last night, Colby, you watched that game against Philly. Like the fact that they gave up that point with what? Nine seconds left. Like that. I know. And the flyers, the flyers were shit. The flyers Mm -hmm. were shit. Like, I think the Islanders tonight, I mean, obviously, you know, every game for them is pretty much must win, but like they're, they're not technically out yet. You know, a win tonight gets them one point back or two points back of a playoff spot. And if you if you lose to Chicago, then I, I mean, like, if the Islanders lose this game to the Blackhawks tonight, I I I don't know how that fan base shows up for any game the rest of the season. I, I would I would literally boycott every game because this team has just gone back and forth all year long. They've gotten favors from every other team in the East to allow them to stay in this playoff race, and they continue to not show up in the games that matter most or just take you know, 10 minutes off in a game and cost themselves a point. Um, so, listen, the Islanders tonight against Chicago, probably not a must-watch game if you're you know an outside perspective fan in the NHL, but uh, certainly a must-win game for the Islanders, and I would say – to me, that's the the biggest game as far as like playoff implications go. Yeah, but there's also um, Boston Nashville tonight, so we kind of see if Nashville can bounce back from a couple of losses after being the hottest team in the league for the last uh-huh. like two and a half months. Um, that's probably the best game to watch, and, and so th- there'll be a lot of speed and a lot of pace yeah. in that Boston game. So that'll be pretty good. Um, and then Vancouver Vegas, oh, Vancouver like, and Vegas, yeah, yeah, Vegas is starting to find their game. I saw. Thomas Hurdle, um, T- Tomas Hurdle was on the ice practicing yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, you can sort of smell it in Vegas. Like it's brewing a little bit right now, in my opinion, in Vegas, the way that they've been winning a little bit. Um, they're starting to play a little bit better overall. You see the standings. Vegas jumped the LA Kings. Nashville also jumped the LA Kings. Now, all of a sudden, the LA Kings, a team that Two months into the season, we were like, this team could win the Stanley Cup. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you've got the St. Louis Blues creeping up on them. I don't foresee them that happening, but certainly creeping up, making the LA Kings feel a little bit more uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it earlier in the week. We said the playoffs were set in the West. Uh, you know, we didn't really see the Blues making this jump. They had a huge win last mm-hmm. night, but I think the loss for LA was even bigger. What are you smiling at? Johnny Shots Isles fans up. will never accept you. You don't have to shill for them. I'm not even You're, shilling. I said I'd boycott the rest of the fucking He's kind of team. been all over you today. He's kind of yeah. been all over you today. I thought we were boys too, honestly. No, man. I don't think you guys are. By the way, just in the last couple of minutes, I saw a report on Twitter from Mark Devere uh, or Diver. I don't know how you say it. He's, he's a Providence-based guy who's mm-hmm. very dialed in on the New England hockey players. Like oh, he's great. The, the college, college hockey guy you're talking about? It's great. He yeah. just put out a tweet that said the Bruins are not in on Colin Graff. They never have been in. Um, that makes sense to me. Colin Graff does not seem like their type of guy. Jacob Quillen does. Um, and also, I saw yesterday that 
the kid um, Jackson Nelson from Minnesota was either yeah. going to or signed with the Bruins. That makes sense to me. Colin Graf to the Boston Bruins does not make sense. The other thing I saw, your buddy um, Matthew uh, Magno. Magno. Is that how you say his last name? Yeah. Magno? Yeah. He he's he was like his co you know Rand Pecknold. His coach said that Colin Graf has a B game and blah blah blah. And like he talked about it. Like listen, I don't agree. I'm just I, and Rand Pecknold and I disagree on this, and we talked about it. Because every mm -hmm. time I do a, a Quinnipiac game when it matters, playoffs and other tournament, Graf gets really quiet. He fades away when these games get really physical and really fast and really that thorough. Turnover, dude. A, yeah, but I'm listen. Yeah, it was a terrible turnover that that basically ended their season. He doesn't get that puck deep. He turns it over. Boston College goes down and scores and ties the game up. Boston College yeah. had four shots in the third period. Four shots. So, I played a perfect third period. Perfect that third play. period, except so I totally disagree that Graf has a B game and that Graf has the tendency or the the tenacity to figure it out as a bottom lineup player. That's that that's the you know I just wanted to visit that. I saw those popping into the chat during the show. So um, we've got our games to look forward to tonight. We talked about Fedotov. I think the Flyers should definitely start him next game. He looked really mm, good. I mean, he stopped percent. like four breakaways last night. The one like that the seal got in, in that commercial, <laughs> which is so true. He yeah. literally looks like what is the seal's name? It's like an all state commercial. It, yeah, I think it's like Sammy. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's Sammy. Yeah. I'm blanking I, on that it. That right commercial is really funny. I saw yeah. you put that on Twitter. Um, that, that is really true. That's how the guy <laughs> looks. So, um, I think that's all we have for today. Um, I, uh, I don't know if we've locked any guests in for the for the rest of the week. I know you you had some ideas of some people you were gonna check in with. Yeah, um, I'll follow up. I, I did I I I reached out to Macklin Celebrini last night um just to see what their schedule was like this week. I know they practice in the morning at BU. Um if not, maybe I'll check in and see if Jay Pandolfo might want to come on the show. That'd be cool. You know, he's a longtime NHL or Stanley Cup guy, coached in the NHL, obviously going back to his second frozen four so i could maybe check in with him but keep an eye on our social medias because we will try to let you know if we lock anyone in for the next two days um don't forget to like and subscribe to the dfo youtube page that stuff goes a long way in helping to build our show um and, and build our audience out which will allow us to do more stuff um and and maybe do more things that are live together events things like that um you want the last word here johnny or are we taking it home no i'm just getting in the chat is uh johnny's a closet Islanders fan johnny is a canes fan johnny's my favorite Islanders fan. i don't think I, you're a canes fan that I'm definitely I, not a canes fan. I do think you you are so desperate to be liked that you do kind of kiss up to uh, the islanders people a little bit and you do shill for them i well, think I'm i agree a, with I'm, that i'm around them like i i but don't like, tell me you're a hockey fan and you like the Islanders because the Islanders are not I don't like the Islanders as a team. team. I don't like the Islanders as a team. I like Barzal. I've always liked Barzal. I've said that always um, as a player. But like, do you think he's a franchise player? I I told Colby yesterday to do a, an April Fool's uh, Barzal franchise player joke, but it's not a franchise player. Yeah. I mean, he's a good player, but he's not a franchise cornerstone. All right, let's uh, let's wrap this one up today. Great show today. Big thanks to Frank Saravalli again, as always, for hopping on every Tuesday. A big thank you to the chat, too. You guys were electric today. That was awesome. And we'll probably use you the next two days, too, if we don't lock in a guest. But I'm sure we're going to try to get somebody on here at least tomorrow. Thursday might be a little bit tougher, but we'll figure it out. And a uh, big thank you to Vic. And we will talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. Enjoy the hockey night. See you at 9 a.m. What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Saravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantastic content, so hit that subscribe button.